Hey guys, my name is Ryan, and we're back again with another Spirit Island video. A couple weeks ago, I made a video recapping the thematic board campaign that I ran where we played every spirit without repeat against every adversary, all on the thematic boards. Before this campaign, I had never really touched the thematic boards unless the Handelabra app randomly rolled it for me. But it was a really good time. I definitely recommend playing on the thematic boards if you're looking for a way to spice up your games of Spirit Island. Today, I want to dive into these thematic boards and explore what makes them so interesting and different, as well as discuss some other board stuff. So the thematic campaign was played on the play-by-post format. We had a dedicated Discord channel to upload our moves via text, then whenever everyone was submitted, I would resolve all the effects on my save file and then upload a screenshot of the next board state. Clear and effective communication is crucial for PBPs to work well, and one good habit is to identify every land by both their board letter and land number, but also include the terrain type. So, for example, if I wanted to target this land with a power, I'd identify it as H3, but I'd also identify it as a mountain, so I would say that I'm using a power in the H3 mountain. This way, you can have the host be more confident that you're targeting the correct land, because it is unlikely that you would, um, you know, let's say I was intending to target the H2 sands, okay, but I wrote H3, or maybe I wrote like H2 mountains, right? There's a discrepancy there. Did I intend to target H2, which is a sand, or H3, which is a mountains? Particularly in situations Maybe there's a coastal ravage where there is a good strategic reason to do either one of them. When there is that discrepancy, throws up the red flag, and the host can then ask for clarification. In our first game or two, we had tons and tons of these issues where the terrain type was not matching the identified land. And I suspect the reason for this is actually kind of funny. So when we play Spirit Island over and over and over, or any game really, we're going to internalize so much information to the point that we're kind of stop reading the cards and components. And this is the way that rule errors can sit in your mind for years because you're just so confident that something works in a certain way, you just don't need to go back and double check. Then one day you play with someone who knows the real rule and you learn a lot that day. But one really subtle thing that I've become conditioned to and I've stopped paying too close attention to is the way that all these boards are laid out. If we take a look at all of the balanced boards, you know, the ones that we spend most of our time on, uh, how are they all laid out? Well, they all have three coastal lands and five inlands, but uh, they're largely arranged in a 3-3-2 pattern. So let's zoom in on board A here. The three, the first group of three is the coastal group of three. Then there's an inland three, and then and uh, like a deep inland group of two. Uh, and so if we take a look at the numbers of the lands, okay, we can see the coast goes from top to bottom, one, two, three. But then the inlands flip. It goes from bottom to top. You got four, five, six going up, and then the deep inlands going seven, eight, going up like that. And uh, we will see that this pattern is consistent across all of the boards except for D and E. So three down, three up, two up, down, up, up, down, up, up, three, three, two, three, uh, three, two. Uh, D and E make it a little bit different. They do a three, two, three pattern. So you've got your three coastals that go from top to bottom, but then four and five go up and then it resets coming back down a little bit to board six before continuing up through eight. Similarly with board E, one, two, three goes down, four, five goes up, and then six, seven, eight goes up again. But that's a tiny little semantic difference. It doesn't have a lot of strategic implications or anything. It's just a numbering system, but it is a consistent numbering system that works the same on every single balance board. And so for that reason, it's something that we can kind of internalize and just assume that's how it works. But au contraire, the thematic boards work different. So where all of these ones, uh, when the oceans on the left-hand side um, go from 
top to bottom, if we take a look at these ones, the west ones where the ocean's on the left, they go from bottom to top. So one, two, three goes up and then it reverses. Four, five, six goes down, seven, eight, nine goes down. With west, one, two, three goes up, then you got four, five, resets, six, seven, eight, nine, and then sweeps out for 10. So you got your three layers there. On the southwest, we got one, two, three going up, but this one is different again. Now, the southwest and the southeast are the two that were released with Jagged Earth, and you can see that that logic of the straight lines is different here for the southwest one, where it goes up and then down and then up and then down. So this one does like a zigzag pattern. So this completely breaks that. And we can follow the same exact logic on this other side, right? Like if we were to rotate this, then instead of going, you know, down, like up, down, down, it would, you know, be the opposite. So it would go down, up, up. In the same way, uh, it's like the same orientation of rotation. So we've got one, two, three, four, but then this one kind of bounces around. We got a layer of one, and then it goes up again, six, seven, eight, nine. So this one does a little bit of a swirl. Uh, one, two, three coming down. Then this one swirls back up, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, uh, nine, ten. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This one works in the same kind of like, you know, forward front to back pattern as the other. So the, the, the point of this is that the numbering layout is less consistent with the thematic boards to other thematic boards and it is logically opposite of how the balanced boards are so if you're just just in your mind you just know that you know this land in the upper left corner is always land number one it's not this is land number one in the lower corner not the upper corner maybe that's the kind of thing that only play by post players are going to pay attention to because in a normal physical game, you're not referring to things as, you know, hey, land three or whatever. You're just putting your finger like, hey, I'm doing stuff right here. But for as someone who does a lot of play by posts, uh, this stuck out to me like a sore thumb. And I did not realize how much it was going to bother me. Moving on to something that's actually useful. The thematic boards have dramatic fundamental gameplay differences. For starters, Three of them have nine lands, and three of them have ten lands. So in total, there are 57 lands across these six boards. That's one more land than if we were to have seven balanced boards. I've played extra board games, and they're very fun, but seeing that whole extra tile on the board can be very stressful. It takes up a lot of visual space, whereas the thematic boards, they give you the same challenge in terms of lands per player, but it's sneaky and you won't even notice. What you will notice though is the inconsistent quantity of lands of each terrain. On the screen, you can see the counts for each land in each board. If you're pressured into playing the thematic boards and you really don't want a dynamic experience, go with the Northeast board. You can see that it has two of each terrain type except it has three jungles. Well, it also happens to have four coastal lands so imagine if we were to just fuse lands two and three together, that would be two of each terrain type. It would have three coastal lands. It would be very normal. And in fact, it would look a heck of a lot like a board F. Hold on a second. Same coastal lands. You've got the, uh, the two jungles adjacent to each other, coastal and inland, right? All we have to do is switch this mountain to this wetlands, and you've basically got the same exact board. The other boards, besides the northeast one, all have a one of terrain, though everyone has at least two mountains. Wetlands being so underrepresented across the island was very shocking to me. This massive river going right down the middle of board E, I think is the most famous, most iconic part of the thematic boards. So I completely overlooked how outside of this big pocket right here, there's just scant few wetlands everywhere else. Just a little splash here and there. I think the second most iconic part of the thematic boards is these two central mountain areas. All of the mountain terrains on the island, beside this little scoundrel, are all together in these two large groups. 
And kind of like how the aforementioned river is right here, and you can imagine that that is like a river, you can imagine these as two big mountain peaks. And I particularly like how you could see the river flowing out of the mountain and into the ocean. Maybe that's a little waterfall or a little lake or something here. I think this is really nice design. You can visualize how this would appear in the real world. Uh, this river flows into a bunch of jungles. So not just to the ocean, but you know, creating vegetation all out this way. I think it's really nice. It's a shame they had to put a sands here. Um, maybe that's just like a big old plateau, but you know, these two mountain areas and this big river, very iconic, very cool, makes you play, feel like you're playing a real game. But I, I digress. The point is that there are no coastal mountain terrains anywhere on the island. And that definitely has some strategic impacts. Uh, you know, if you get a back to back, like a mountains into coast, that means that there will not be any back to back lands. Normally with all the, um, balance boards, you're very likely when you have a multiplayer setting that someone is getting a back to back every single time the coastal card shows up, but not necessarily here. There is a very nice distribution, pretty much evenly balanced across the other three terrain types. Uh, the Northeast board, like I said, has four coastal lands, and that's why there's an odd number. Anyways, let's see how this sets up without an adversary. On the balance boards, there's always a city in land number two, and then there's an inland town such that every single land on the board has a source of explorers. When I teach new people the game, I don't get into the whole mechanic of killing towns, making a pocket, and denying explorers, since that's almost never relevant anyways. These thematic boards are wild though. With a normal setup, we have 16 lands that are immediately pocketed and can ignore the initial explore. In addition, there are five wilds tokens out across the island. So for the opening explore, more than a third of the island gets to dodge it. Well, why are there so many pockets? Across the island, there's only three lands with inland buildings. In the original four boards from the base game, the only land with an inland building is Northeast 5, which I guess plays a little more into the whole Northeast being the most normal board thing. But both of the southern boards, which were added with Jagged Earth, they both have a land with inland building with Southwest 4 and Southeast 6. Of course, every adversary does add a little plastic to the starting board, but more often than not, this will not make a difference. Prussia, England, Russia, Scotland, and HME all do not move the needle for inland buildings. Only Sweden, France, and HLC add buildings inland. Now, there are going to be some situations where even though you don't add a inland building, you can still increase the number of lands which will get explored. For example, uh, if we get a town in this land number three here, then this Northwest six will explore. However, those are very small things and it's not a very large dramatic difference like had we added a building into Northwest 8, which would open up a lot more. This makes the initial explore insanely swingy. If you get jungles, you get a normal game. But if you get the mountains, you basically get a free turn. Like everyone gets a free turn. It's such a bizarrely dynamic first turn and it could completely shape the game. While there may be large pockets, take note that there are four lands in those pockets which do start with explorers, so they can still be a threat when their card comes up. I mentioned the five wilds before, but there's tons of tokens across the island which provide us with free value. A wild can fully solve a land for us. If we deny the explore, we deny the build, and then come time for the ravage, there's no plastic there, and so there is no threat of blight from the ravage. Uh, since the end point that really matters is preventing that blight, in the same way, a vitality can also fully solve the land. Because no matter how much plastic is there, we deny the blight from coming down. And also, up here in Northeast 9, with this disease, under most adversaries, that will also prevent a blight. Because a single explorer, you know, prevent the build from happening, but a single explorer will not blight the land. When we do too much of anything, that activity can become stale, and finding ways to shake it up and inject life and excitement back into the activity is important. 
So with that in mind, I think the thematic boards are fantastic for any veteran player to play on to, you know, shake things up and move away from just the rote standard, everything's kind of memorized that you can run into with these balanced boards. One of the things I've been harping on in many of my videos is aspiring to break free from the invisible cage that is your starting board. If that is something that you struggle with, perhaps that's a good reason to give these a go. East board is the most dramatic. When anything besides wetlands come up, you're relatively at an advantage, so you can invest time and actions into other people's board to help them stabilize or get ahead. But on the other hand, when the wetlands does appear, everyone else will be at an advantage and they can jump over and help you. While this is certainly the most dramatic with the East Wetlands, there's a variety of terrain quantities on every board, so every turn, someone, somewhere, should be disproportionately harder or easier handling their invaders, and the team can come together and work appropriately. The thematic boards are designed so that you can use any number of them in a game, even just one. But as I was making this video, I got into a new and exciting play-by-post which takes the thematic concept and turns it up to 11. This is a custom world map designed for a 5-player game. The idea, of course, is to protect the whole planet, and to that end, it breaks some rules. I've drawn some red lines to indicate the edges of each of the starting boards. On the thematic boards, there is at least one land of each terrain type on each board, in order to keep them playable at all player counts. But since this world map is designed solely for five players, that restriction no longer exists. North America and Asia both have no jungles, and there's no wetlands in the Southern Hemisphere, which has South America, Africa, and Australia. To the degree that there is a marginal advantage on the different thematic boards based on the terrain type, this is so much more with these. As of recording, I'm only on turn 3 in this game, and so it's far too early to tell exactly how it's going to play out, but all I know is that I'm having a great time. In fact, I think this taps into a design space that's been completely ignored. Coming from the Age of Empires 2 scene, where custom maps are a huge deal, I think an interesting future for Spirit Island can be exploring ideas with new and different custom maps. This game does come with a scenario card, which I'll put on the screen now, and I'll mention that my game is against the Habsburg Livestock Colony, so Northern Europe is incredibly busy. We also have a finder of paths unseen in our game, and so they're working on getting everything down to Antarctica so it can chill out for a while. Alternative maps force you to think through things more critically, since many of the assumptions that we have are based on the balanced boards. So for today's gameplay video, we're going to play a random game on a thematic board to shake it up. Alright, so I randomly rolled into the northwest board with Brandenburg, Prussia. Let's see how it goes. Alright, Sand Wetland starting off pretty aggressive. Interesting. Yeah, we're starting on a pocket. And that's pocketed too. Oh, interesting. So... We could just predatory nightmares here, maybe defend it, and then... Uh, that would put us in a decent starting position. Let's see what we get. Because a good defend card could also be used here. Devouring ants, any kind of damage I do like to take. Um, just so that way, you know, you can just produce more fear. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly play Predatory Nightmares over Devouring Ants, at least at first. Dire Metamorphosis is a tri element card, so always worth considering. And if we do that, we would do a damage there. Dire Metamorphosis is a super good card, so we're going to take it. But for now, we're just going to... Well, let's see, how much... Defend can we produce? Because it's going to be ravaging for 5. I think we would not produce enough. So we'll just do a Predatory Nightmares. Like a Dream of the Dahan play. Get these guys into the game. Or, yeah, we could we could do a... Or maybe we just do a Dreams of the Dahan called Midnight's Dream. Just pick ourselves right off with 4 energy right off the bat. 
Let's do it. Let's just go fast and aggressive, taking advantage of a little bit of free time. And let's see, a fear card. The first ones generally don't matter, so I like to start here. Okay, so a beast. We don't have any beast on the board. Excellent. I mean, maybe this means that we now prioritize playing this Dire Metamorphosis, which adds a beast, and now we can make use of it. And what do we get? Insatiable Hunger of the Swarm is insanely aggressive. We have no beast, <laughs> but it's insanely aggressive. Tsunami would be interesting because we could play Tsunami right now. And we could hit this. So that would be 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 fear right off the bat. Uh, get us 3 fear cards going into the first Ravage. That's pretty spicy. Angry Bears is another... We got 3 beast ones. That's wild. Yeah, Tsunami is very expensive. So you play it once, then you're kind of just like stuck for a little bit. Angry Bears getting the fear, the beast, the push. We get two fear, the two damage. So we get four fear. That's a full fear card. And that would push the town out. Then we can defend with the Dread Apparitions here, leaving just these two lands behind, taking two blight as whatever. And then it's cheap enough we can actually play it again in the future, which is something that I, you know, like to do. Angry Bears is pretty well paired up with Predatory Nightmares in terms of elements. Though getting that third air wouldn't happen for a... Uh, third moon in order to get us the third animal wouldn't happen for a long time. Hmm... Yeah, on, on a standard board, I would go for Insatiable Hunger and just play this, like, stupid aggressively, right? Because if we could, like, add a beast, bring in a beast in here, uh, we would get two fear plus the five. Yeah, we'd get, like, seven fear fast and just, like, go nuts. Let's go with this Angry Bears. Let's keep it cheap. And reliably only take two Blight next turn. Hmm. We'll go... Let's see, if we defend this, I don't think we have another means of defense necessarily. So I don't know if that's something that we want to do. Going right here. Let's go right there. Maintain a pocket on the 9 at least. Okay, we could also die in metamorphosis this up here. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's just keep gaining power cards for a little bit. Make our hand nice and tall. Entrancing Apparitions is a nice little way to deal with that problem. You could just like target this land up here and gather both of these guys out, prevent the build. Prowling Panthers is another way of getting Beast on the, to the table. And we can use it to kill off a town for two fear. So that's an interesting card. In fact, we could add a beast here to the four and just make a point to getting, uh, what is that? 10 fear over the next couple turns. I like that play. Uh, so let's see, another fear card. Strife in a land with Dahan, good to know. Hmm. I could sack two presents for a power card, which I think is a great idea. It's getting rid of the two from the sands back here that's largely uninvolved in the game. I think it's worth it. Yeah, so we'll leave behind. I don't know if that. Wait, no, hold on. No, we want painful cr uh, trade reach. Okay, that's what it's called. Sorry. And let's gain a miner. Shadows of the Burning Forest gives us some interesting control um, on these mountains back here. And if we can keep control of this whole group, and then we hopefully just never explore this wetlands, that would be pretty spicy. Defend 
defend three in the coast almost gets it done. It now does get it done. Nice, only one blight. Believe in the fear. Uh, we want to make sure that we add a town so we don't explore this. And get our fear there. Okay, how much fear do we need? We need six fast fear. I might have miscalculated. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> Maybe we go for a major. We could do that. Uh, we have plenty of energy and probably going to play Shadows of the Burning Forest up here anyways. Sleep Tiger's Hunting. Tiger's Hunting, we go here, we add the beast. And um, yeah, just push it out. That solves our problem immediately. Uh, it's cheap. It's kind of playable over and over. We can send stuff over here and we can get value from it. Um, combines well with the Angry Bears. We're turning into a Beast Spirit all of a sudden. Maybe this Dire Metamorphosis isn't playable anymore. Adding that Blight might not be great. Or it could be exactly what we need. Uh, let's get rid of... Maybe this Angry Bears is too slow. It does produce a good amount of fear for how cheap it is. Beasts are generally, like, very efficient. Maybe Predatory Nightmares. That's, a, that's an expensive card. We have better cards now. And then I could use Dire Metamorphosis over here to kill and explore and strife off the town to prevent that blight from happening. Uh, we'll push some beasts over here, and we can use, like, a Tiger's Hunting and some other shenanigans in order to make that work. Two elements away, not one element away from thresholding. Yeah, we need... That's okay. Uh, we'll just make this land insane. We'll figure that one out later. And the beast will remove that. Um, that's good. Maybe we can change the way that we push and we can uh, go here and then we can go here and here. Jason, another beast one, okay. Oh, Asim. That sucks. Beast deal damage. Okay, so over here, this one's going to be too far away for Tiger's Hunting. Let's just pick off the town. Uh, over here. I think it's fine. Just pick off the town. And then over here, since we know we're going to remove it, we want to keep our Tiger's Hunting up, we'll do that. Strife in a land with presence. Remove that. And we have one land to deal with, which I'm sure we can do just fine. Okay, focusing on the sands now. So we could once again just go for like a big fat major. Because uh, we're going to need something for this too. We have tons of energy. We can put anything up that costs up to six in that land. Blood Rack Plague is interesting. Because we could play Blood Rack, reclaim, play it again. That would give us a defend three. We could like target this land twice. That would solve both of these. That would still look at a Blight Cascade over here. Hmm. Bargains of Power and Protection is certainly interesting. But it does kill off one of our presents, which is not as cool. I don't hate the idea of a double Blood Rack. We could do that. We can do that. 
It's not amazing. Avengers of the Dead is just straight up three fear because we don't kill things. Yeah, let's do that. Getting rid of this dire metamorphosis. We're probably not going to be able to play it ever again. Okay, good thing that's strife, so we're okay. Disease to an inland land with the most buildings. Um, go here, because if we push it out with the Shadows of the Burning Forest, then that's going to full solve our next jungle. Yep, yeah, so we can push that out of the jungle and then we'll be a-okay. And now it's definitely just going to turn into a big old fury. So we're looking at a Blight Cascade here. And we can do a push out of this mountain with the Shadows of the Burning Forest. Um, and we do have some Dahan movement with the Dread Apparitions. That's an interesting one. We'll try that. Also gets our destroyed presence back. In case this blight card threatens something like that. Yeah, same cards over again. Go here, get our AoE defend 3. Get some fear. Kind of a weak set of turns, to be honest. With invaders not matching a build card. So we could just go here. Sacrifice the disease, that's fine. Uh, that's actually unfortunate. I really do want that to be there. Strife in a land with or adjacent to beast. We can go right here to strife this guy off. Hopefully it doesn't explore and that is solved. Wait, hold on. Strife in a land with or adjacent to beast. We have Stricken. So we can use Stricken in order to um, prevent this from going. Okay, that's great. It's great value for us. That's unfortunate. Um, let's see. We have no information on fear cards. We know we've got this Tiger's Hunting. Which we can do some work with. And uh, let's see, so pushing to the sands is now safe. Jungle's wetlands are coming up next. This Blood Rack Plague is sucks and we're not gonna wanna play it again. Actually, that's a lie. We could just use Blood Rack Plague right here and defend everything. So in that sense, since we could do that, then we'll just push out of this land, then use our Blood Rack Plague, defend everything, and just keep this party going. And reclaim this. Okay. Generally it sucks, but I guess when you can play it every turn, it slowly turns into a serpent. As for what we play in the second slot, we do get the free element don't have any earth animals. Getting any kind of a moon will then be able to convert ourselves into more things. So like if we take this tiger's hunting, take the tiger's hunting, any into a moon, and then we're still two elements short. Over here, at the media, we, we miss out on the any. That's a tri-element that matches the tiger's hunting. That's good to keep in mind. And it clears out the blight for us. We could just Tiger's Hunting over here next turn. So really it's land number three that we're going to care about. We could also play like an Angry Bears because this is going to build and we can pop the town and move it out. That might be the best play. And if we just take a moon here, we get the extra fear. Got an 
explore to a land with blight. Defend three, that's now a defend four. We don't get the extra damage, so that's totally a-okay. In fact, we get a, the push on the town. Yeah, so we'll go here, and then we can push this town over here, because then the Dahan will attack it and kill it. Two explorers or a town from a land with Dahan. Well, that solves that problem. And we're... Nope, there's a town there, so we're not pocketed. But maybe this Bloodrack Plague is actually an amazing card. It's not trash. I'm sorry I said those things about you. So Tiger Hunting is not going to do a ton over here, but it is fear and value. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's see. Yeah, and if I use this Tiger's Hunting and combine with the Sky's Herald, it gives me the two sun, the three moon, two animals, the three moon turn into a third animal. That gives me a threshold on Tiger's Hunting. So I think I'll play those two cards. I can move the Blight out of this land, so that way the threshold can pop over and, um, you know, hit a city and just produce as much fear as we can. So... That's going to be my play. And I will do this Call to Ferocity. Maybe we can find Dahan and Defend Value. Now, since we're playing some pretty cheap cards here, I'm going to hold off on this fifth energy for now. We really don't have any super expensive stuff going on. So I'm going to push ourselves towards the three card plays. That could really change the game. Um, so we'll take the air to max the innate. But then when we do this to reveal a fear card, remove an invader from a land matching a ravage card, that could be relevant, then that should threshold here. Excellent. Push our blight out. Beast comes in. Two damage. Push you over here. These guys will push. We get one damage. Uh in an adjacent land. Gets us five fear. One fear card away from winning. This gets us one fear away from winning. And we might, we might have a healthy win. One damage per beast. Yes, because that will hit a town. That'll get us the fear. And that will get us a terror level three victory on the thematic boards. Bring our dreams and nightmares. Super fun matchup. Uh, we definitely got a few pockets that uh, <laughs> that saved our bacon, but that's okay. You take what you can. We have nine boards to deal with, so more than a normal game. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys give these uh, thematic boards a try. They're very fun, very interesting, and it shakes things up. Until next time, have a glorious day.